on guys my name is Zed and welcome to this video this is this week's episode of uh, last week in pop culture now if you want to skip my opening monologue then skip to this timestamp right here no hard feelings enjoy the show now if you want to stick around what I will say is currently my lower back is out um, so I didn't even think that I would be able to get this episode out this week, but I decided to just kind of persevere, push through it and get these final segments out. So this opening, this, this, this actual like opening of the video and then some of the segments in the video were shot just a couple of hours and edited just a couple of hours before the video went out. So I hope you guys enjoy. Now the first thing I would love to discuss with you is the upcoming Green Lantern Corps TV show coming to HBO Max. Now it has been indicated that this show will have three main timelines or eras, 1940s, 1980s, and present day. Now it looks like Alan Scott will be our powering man during the 1940s. Uh, it seems like his arc will be about his uh, sexuality, him being gay in the 1940s and how society views that. And I love that. I love that approach. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of Alan Scott. Uh, I think he has the coolest, one of the coolest costumes in all the comic books. And I hope they go the comic book route. And I think it just fits for the 1940s suburbia. And then we flash forward to the 1980s, Guy Gardner will be our Green Lantern. And in the comic books, he has portrayed as this hyper-masculine guy. And they're going to go Go that route for the series as well. Now I really haven't heard much about the present day and which Green Lanterns they'll be focusing on, but they've kind of talked about it here and there. Uh, there's been people speculating on it, been casting rumors, character rumors, and character announcements, so I'm pretty sure present day is going to be a plethora of different characters, but I'm super excited to see characters like Alan Scott and Guy Garner getting a bit of a spotlight. Um, now, we don't really know uh, how this show is going to traverse the different time periods and how it's going to be kind of um, uh, framed, uh, but it's super exciting and I, I definitely trust HBO to get it right. And then next, we're going to be talking about some MCU rumors. Now, it looks like Marvel might be eyeing Elle Fanning to portray Kate Bishop in the upcoming Disney Plus series, Hawkeye. Now, in the past, we have heard casting rumors and fan speculations that maybe Haley Steinfeld would kind of jump into the role. Now, either way, I absolutely adore Elle Fanning. So even if she does not get this role, I would love to see her down the line in the MCU anyways. So in my mind, at least they're considering casting her in some type of role. Now, in some more exciting Marvel news, it looks like the crew of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness have started arriving in London. Uh, which means principal photography should be starting here soon. And I can't wait. I mean, this movie uh, has, you know, Elizabeth Olsen in it, um, has Benedict Cumberbatch, and it has a slew of other people and rumors. Um, and I, I really can't wait. Oh, Benedict Wong, I mean, it's going to be a great, there's been casting calls going out. Um, this is definitely one of my most anticipated MCU movies to date because it's going to really... I imagine it's going to really open up the, the universe, <laughs> the potential universe. And then into some James Bond news, actress Lashana Lynch, who is going to be portraying a character in the upcoming No Time to Die movie, has confirmed herself that she will be taking over the role of 007 after this final movie uh, retires Daniel Craig from the role. Now, look... You can take that as you will, take it as face value. This is my opinion, right? One of my favorite shows is Doctor Who. Now, in that show, the Doctor is has been traditionally played by a man, but a couple years back, Jodie Whittaker was casted, giving us our first female Doctor. Now, there were a lot of people, including some past actors who have played the Doctor, who, who were against this idea and said that it takes away uh, a boy's role model. I disagree uh, completely. I think that it is a great idea. Um, both Doctor Who and James Bond are long-running series with a plethora of different movies and male idols. Giving a female, a little girl, a woman, an idol within this James Bond universe is exciting to me. 
Now, I don't know whether or not she'll be taking on the James Bond name. I just know that she'll be taking over the 007 mantle. So, um, overall, I'm excited. And, and, and uh, Lashana um, Lynch herself even said that, you know, uh, this would have been the reaction if any woman were casted. And it would have been the reaction if any black woman was casted. And she knows that with all the threats and all the disgusting emails and messages she has received, this would have happened to anybody. Um, and she is very excited to be on this side of history uh, and kind of bring in a new era of James Bond. And though I'm not entirely privy of the series, like I I've only seen a handful, I think with like Pierce Brosnan's uh, 007, I'm super excited. And then into some Star Wars news. Felicity Jones, who famously played Jen Erso in the Rogue One, a Star Wars story movie, has come out saying that there is some unfinished business with the Star Wars franchise. And that means that there could be potential for Jen Erso to pop up in future movies. Now, if you haven't seen the end of Rogue One, then spoiler alert, everyone kind of died <laughs> so maybe she survived somehow i'm not entirely sure maybe this will be a story that um comes before the events of rogue one um but i really enjoyed this movie i thought it was a good tie-in um so whatever happens i'm looking forward to it and uh, felicity jones is just a fantastic actress and let's move into some record-breaking news that kate winslet on the set of avatar 2 breaks the holding breath record uh, for longest time spent underwater filming a single scene. Now, Kate Winslet held her breath for 7 minutes and 14 seconds. She's been training to do free diving for this movie because there is apparently a ton of water involved. Now, the previous record holder is pretty well known. Tom Cruise held his breath for 6 minutes and 30 seconds on the set of Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Now, that right there, I've actually tried to hold my breath uh, for that. There's a, there's a challenge where um, you would watch the scene and hold your breath as long as you could. And I think I made it to like 2 minutes and 30 seconds before I was like, my, my big heart can't take this. I need to pump oxygen. My brain's going to fucking die. <laughs> like I was I was not uh, good on that. But, uh, but I'm really excited to see what James Cameron has been cooking up for the past 10 years on the Avatar franchise. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing this actual scene come to life. Now in some superhero news, Brandon Ralph, famously known for playing Superman in Brian Singer's Superman Returns movie, has stated that there is potential, a possibility for his Superman to appear in the upcoming Flash movie set to release in 2022. Now, he just reprised his role in a sense in the Crisis on Infinite Earths um, story plot in the Arrowverse. And I think that whole thing where, where, the, where the audience and, and fans were super excited for that has now put in Warner Brothers' minds that maybe there's a possibility to bring Ralph back for more, and I'm all for it. I mean, Ralph is such a team player. He loves the character. He loves the fans. And even if it's just for a small little cameo, um, I'd love to see it. So in some DC television news, actor and comedian Jim Gaffigan was casted as Thunderbolt for Stargirl Season 2. Now, I don't know whether or not he'll be playing uh, Johnny Thunder as well, the kind of vessel for Thunderbolt, uh, but I know for a fact he won't be playing Jakeem Thunder. This does have me excited as Stargirl was one of the highlights of this year. Um, but, uh, Jim Gaffigan is also a comedian that I have really enjoyed in the past. So, um, I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do. He is definitely a pretty damn good actor. Now in some MCU television news, Loki was just renewed for a season two, which is pretty cool. It seems like they have confidence in the season one, um, e even before it premieres on the Disney Plus streaming platform. Um, I love Tom Hiddleston, I love the character of Loki, so as long as they keep the character fresh, then I'm going to be there for it. Now in some extremely sad news, uh, longtime Jeopardy host Alex Trebek dies at 80 after a long battle with pancreatic cancer. Uh, he died at home surrounded by family, 
and I uh, hope he went peacefully. Um, Jeopardy was a show that I watched a lot um, during the final years that my great grandmother was alive and uh, those memories will always mean a lot to me and uh, Alex Trebek is just a, a, he's a stand-up model um, for everyone he's, he's just he's just a great intelligent funny um, beautiful man so it was, it was very very hard to hear that now in some Warner Brothers news, Johnny Depp comes out with a statement declaring that Warner Brothers have asked him to step down from his role in the Fantastic Beast franchise. Now pause the video if you would like to read Depp's statement and uh, tell me what you think. Now he has brought to life the role of Grindelwald. And uh, to varying degrees, people have liked it or disliked it. Personally, I enjoyed the second Fantastic Beasts and even the reveal in the uh, first Fantastic Beasts. But um, I'm kind of troubled by this um, a little bit. Um, I, I believe that it is due to his recent legal allegations. Um, none where he is the... Um, all of them where he is the victim and it's just unfortunate that because of that publicity that uh, Johnny Depp is getting uh, Warner Brothers has asked him to basically leave their project um, that's unfortunate now I know there's a bunch of um, people out there that are putting together um, petitions and such to get uh, Johnny Depp back on the projects but uh, now, I don't know how well that will work, but I hope that Warner Brothers sees the fan outpour and will reconsider uh, Depp for the role, just as uh, Disney reconsidered um, Gun for Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I'm losing my voice. Now, in some more DC TV show news, it looks like the character King Shark will be making an appearance in the Peacemaker HBO Max television show. Which is pretty exciting. Uh, this show will also star John Cena as Peacemaker. And um, it just makes me excited that King Shark will hopefully not be killed in the uh, in the Suicide Squad. Uh, he's an adorable little, little nugget of joy and uh, I really like his design. And um, I'm excited to see uh, if more characters from the Suicide Squad will make appearances in the Peacemaker TV show. Alright folks, before we get into it, this is your forewarning. Spoilers ahead for The Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 2, Chapter 10, The Passenger. So if you have not seen it, then uh, go watch it, come back, and let's talk about it. So in its most simplification, this uh, episode is about how many things can go wrong because Baby Yoda loves snacking. <laughs> the Mando is still looking for other Mandalorian and uh, he is tipped off to a location where they might be, um, but in return, he has to um, basically transport a passenger. Now the passenger is a mother and her unborn embryo eggs. And uh, along the way, Baby Yoda basically takes any opportunity to snack on them and snack on anything he can. And the Mandalorian is constantly trying to, you know, slap his hand away. No, no eating babies. <laughs> uh, overall, I think the, the, the standout of this episode was just how fucking beautiful it was. Like, visually, all of the special effects, all of the costumes, animatronics, puppet, everything sets in this episode were amazing. Um, I had problems with the first episode and it's CGI. I didn't feel like it felt, it didn't feel complete. This episode was damn near seamless. Um, there were points where I could tell where, you know, uh, baby Yoda went from puppet to CGI, but for the general audience, they would just be like, Oh, that's a fucking, that's, that's still baby Yoda. And had a great monster of the week when it came to the giant ice spiders. Zed is terrified of spiders. I absolutely hate them. And I was I was genuinely like, ooh, uh, by this episode. Um, especially when the, the, the ship started filling up with all the spiders. Oh, wow, it was creepy as shit. Um, but, you know, the only disappointing part of this entire episode, the only disappointing part... Is that we, you know, while, while we were in the little hot springs, we didn't get to see some lizard titties. 
I mean, I don't know. It was kind of, you know, I think I feel like that was they, that was uh, you know, kind of uncool of them to not, you know, to kind of they, they were kind of like hinting at it, like, ooh, you might see some lizard titties, and then we didn't, which you know, my feelings aren't hurt, you know, I'm just. You lose! Good day, sir! Alright, folks, so at the end of last week, I said that I'm going to be trying to catch up on 2020 releases. So in the month of November, that's kind of what I'm going to focus on. Um, I'm sure I'll watch a slew of other things, too. Um, but uh, especially this week, I am going to hopefully solely dedicate it to 2020 releases. Um, so this is, uh, last week I watched number 38 and without any further ado, uh, let's get into it. Does my foot smell funny? <laughs> Cause I was wondering. We're watching Breaking Bad. What? It's really good. It's a great show. Have you seen it? Yes, I have seen it. It's great. It's not for kids. So first up this week, I watched On the Rocks. Now this movie stars Rashida Jones, Bill Murray, and is directed by Sofia Coppola, uh, the famous daughter of Francis Ford Coppola. Now I had seen this poster and I had seen the review or the uh, trailer rather, and um, it looked promising. I was definitely into it, um, but unfortunately after watching it, it was just kind of like watching a slow car wreck. It was really unfortunate. You know, Bill Murray gives a pretty good performance. He's very eccentric, very flamboyant. And I like that, you know. Uh, uh, Bill Murray I haven't seen really perform in a couple of years, um, especially as like a leading role. So it was definitely good seeing him in this movie. But the, the plot, if you're, if you're wondering, basically it's about a father and a daughter. Both of them are kind of in a rut in their life. And um, the daughter suspects her husband of cheating. Now, she kind of puts it on herself a bit and says that maybe she's not interesting. Maybe he's lost interest in her. Maybe she needs to, maybe she should have spiced things up. And her father, being the man he is and who has had a past of cheating himself, um, kind of takes it upon himself to uh, get down to... Uh, the brass tacks and and try to figure out whether or not her husband is actually cheating and that's the story it's just like this this like um private investigation that has its merits it has its good moments but just overall and especially towards the end just becomes extremely awkward now this is merely a personal opinion and you're welcome to disagree with it but personally if i were truly truly suspecting my partner or spouse of cheating on me i would feel like if they found out it would not be my responsibility to apologize to them i feel like there is a level of boundaries when it comes to certain things like stalking your loved ones or tapping into their phone but at the end of the day, if I didn't feel stable in the relationship and I didn't feel like I um, had security, then they should be the one apologizing to a certain extent. And that's not what happened in this movie. It was basically like, I like it was basically Rashida Jones. Her husband was Marlon Wayans. Um, it was basically Rashida, Rashida Jones saying like, I'm so sorry. I was so stupid. I shouldn't have done that. Oh my God. I'm just so stupid. I, I, I should never, I should have never done the things I did. My dad made me do it. But, but, and I'm just sitting there watching Marlon Wayne's character going like, yeah, you should be apologizing. That was really fucking stupid. You know, you should know that I love you. If your spouse or significant other suspects you of cheating, you should at least look at yourself too and see what you could have done to prevent those suspicions because they're hurt and now you're hurt and you guys kind of need to work that out i don't this movie just rubbed me the wrong way towards the end i think that's what i'm trying to say um i would give on the rocks two and a half out of five stars and that's purely just because it has pretty good cin cinematography and i did like Bill Murray's performance. When love crumbles, how do you preserve its ruins? 
Why didn't you leave it here? What? No. Come on. No, I can't do that. Just let go. No, no, no. It's really, it's really okay. <laughs> sure. It'll be okay. Okay. Oh, look. A nail. Perfectly placed. So look at that. But the next up, I watched a fantastic movie in the Broken Hearts Gallery. Now, I am a absolute sucker for a love story. I get roped into it so easily, and I tend to love oh, damn near every single one I watch. But this one's pretty unique. Basically, it's about a woman who is very sentimental. And with her past relationship, she likes to keep lots of mementos. And basically, her friends see this as an unhealthy habit. It's not moving on. It's collecting all of these, like, unforgiving memories, you know? And um, she decides to open a gallery where people could donate these mementos, these memories, and kind of no longer be burdened with them. And they can be set up for folks to come in and view and either, you know, relate to it or see something from a different angle. And it was a very unique story. And of course there's some love and, you know, there's some blossoming relationships, but the cast was absolutely fantastic. I loved all the characters. The plot though was a fairly, you know, cliche love story. Most love stories are kind of cliche. You do have the very few where it was like, I was hiking Mount, Mount, Mount Everest and uh, my oxygen was low. And who, who came to me? Sarah. And Sarah had an extra oxygen tank and she gave it to me. And we both traversed the rest of the way. Very few love stories happen that way. Um, so I would give... Uh, the Broken Hearts Gallery, a solid four out of five stars. I absolutely adored it. Talk about an intertwined story. Oh my days. The Devil All the Time is fantastic. I loved every single minute of it. It was riveting. There were times where I, my blood, like my body, my blood ran cold and my hand, my body was shaking. And I was just like with anticipation, with anxiety. This movie is so multi-layered and the stories that are told are so intertwined. I mean, they're going everywhere, but the setup and the plot is something that I wish I could come up with. Like these are the kind of movies that really interest me and motivate me to write, which if you know me, Zed does not write, but these kinds of stories are just so damn good and they stick with me. I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but basically it's about a lot of really bad people, a lot of really bad situations and in some crazy ways, not just a, one way, in some crazy ways, they're all sort of connected. And the way this movie traverses through all these characters, plots, stories, situations, scenarios, the sick and twistedness of all of it, religion, politics, I mean, it's just so captivating. The Devil All the Time, five out of five stars. So what I forgot to mention in this review is how the opening scene which is about like four to five minutes long, reminded me so much of the character Chucky from Good Will Hunting, also played by Ben Affleck. And uh, it just has so many parallels and so many similarities. I was like, am I watching the sequel to Good Will Hunting? Like, is this like Bad Luck Chuck or something? <laughs> I don't know. And for the final movie this week, I watched The Way Back. Now, this movie stars Ben Affleck, and it's basically about um, a guy who is really, really down in life. 
he is recently going through a divorce. Um, there's other, there's deaths in the family. Um, he is working a job that he doesn't too much care for. And he is given this opportunity to coach a basketball team for a school he used to attend. Now, he was an all-star uh, player at this, at this school, um, but he has this drinking problem that is kind of holding him back. And it's basically this whole journey of sobriety and um, coming to uh, terms with your losses in life, no matter if, you know how big or small. And uh, I know this movie was very therapeutic for Ben Affleck, um, as he was an alcoholic himself and going through similar problems in his own life. I felt like this movie, um, at its strongest points, were due to Ben Affleck's performance. He really gave a performance that I felt was real. Um, I have had um, a lot of alcoholics in my life and in my family, and I know what that stuff looks like, and I know what that what that disease can do to somebody. Um, and it it. it it really hit me close to home um, during a couple of those scenes. Uh, but overall, I would say the story uh, it kind of fluctuates in and out. But but overall, when it hits home, it truly hits home. And it, it, it it's extremely impactful. Um, so the way back, I gave three and a half out of five stars. All right, folks, that is it for this week's episode of uh, last week. Um, I did not get around to recording a proper outro, um, but I do appreciate anybody who actually made it to this point. Um, it was a rough end of the week, um, but I'm glad that I actually got to finish this episode because there was some stuff that I was really looking forward to talking about and discussing with people. But uh, thank you guys for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. And until next time, I'll be seeing you later. Peace.